Following the major extinctions at the end of the Cretaceous, new forms of life emerged. Mammals, previously small and insignificant by comparison with dinosaurs, were able to exploit many of the niches left vacant. Earth, after an interval of greenhouse conditions, began its long period of cooling that continued into the Quaternary Ice Age. Grasses, better able to cope with cooler conditions, evolved and spread. During the Paleogene, Earth's geography began to take on a more familiar shape, as Gondwana continued to break up. New oceans widened the gaps between continents, and ocean currents became established. Marine life, devastated by the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous, slowly recovered and became more abundant by the end of the Paleocene. By the mid-Paleogene, mammals had arrived in the oceans, in the forms of whales. During this period, Earth experienced dramatic climate change, with a number of warm and cold cycles lasting roughly 10 million years. After a drop in global temperatures at the end of the Cretaceous, they increased again in the early Paleogene, the soared dramatically about 55, 4 million years ago. Following recovery from the late Cretaceous extinction, the fifth such event, marine invertebrate faunas similar to those of today occupied the available ecospace. A shell-littered shoreline of the Paleogene would look much like today's. Although it was warm, the first stages in global cooling had begun. One factor in the diversity of marine invertebrates during the Paleogene is the evolution of coral reefs. Living coral reefs are of three kinds. Fringing reefs, barrier reefs and atolls. Fringing develop along the shorelines, especially those of volcanic islands. If the island subsides, a circular or horseshoe-shaped atoll will form, and it has been shown by deep drilling through Pacific atolls that coral reefs began in the Paleogene. Because of the soft nature of their bodies, worms are rarely fossilized and the most we know about many shell-less worms are the burrows they made into the sediments. There are some notable exceptions, namely the serpulid worms. T. He's marine polychaete worms, which are relatives of the earthworm, secreted tubes composed of calcium carbonate around themselves to protect their soft bodies. Serpulid worms are therefore preserved as fossils in the same way as other shelled invertebrates. Unlike most surviving serpulid worms, which live cemented to the seabed or to the shells of other invertebrates, rotularia, although attached in its early stages of growth, was free living. Atoria was a nautiloid, similar in a appearance to modern species belonging to the genus Nautilus. It had a very tightly coiled shell with heavily overlapping whorls and a very small umbilicus at the center of the coil. This type of shell is said to be extremely involute. One of Atoria's most distinctive features is its complex suture line with sharply angled folds. These V-shaped lobes face away from the shell's opening, or aperture. In cross-section, the whorls are somewhat compressed, with flattened sides, but the venter is rounded. The shell is smooth, and ornamented only by very fine growth lines. It is likely to have lived in fairly open water and probably fed on small fish and small crustaceans. Xenophora is a genus of marine gastropod that still exist in the world's seas today. Among other distinctive features, it had a conical shell with a fairly low cone, and very little overlap between successive whorls. There are strong growth markings on the shell, most clearly visible on its base. Also on the underside, the central umbilicus is narrow and steep-sided. Unlike many gastropods, which have nodes on their shells, Xenophora's bumpy outline was the result of shell fragments or rock particles embedded in its shell. The animal picked up pieces of shells and held them in the mantle margin against the outside of its soft body until other shell material was secreted around the foreign objects to fix them into place. Gastropods of the genus Athleta were predatory carnivores. Its fossil have a distinctive shape, with the tip of the shell forming a small, steep cone. As the animal matured, the whorls of its shell broadened. The most prominent parts of the shell's ornament are the spiny nodes on the shoulder of the outermost whorl at the widest part of the S. Hell. From these nodes, ribs run up to the whorl suture, where the whorls join, and down the side of the outermost whorl. The mouth of the shell is long, with a notch at the side for the inhalant siphon, a tubular structure used by the animal to take in water. Clavolitz was a stout gastropod with a large shell that had flat-sided whorls that barely overlapped each other, 
the whorl suture, where one whorl joined the newt, was distinctly stepped, and the outside of the shell was covered with growth lines. The shell opening was large and oval in shape. Comparisons with modern, related forms suggest that it was carnivorous. Venericor was a filter-feeding bivalve. Its shell was a rounded triangular shape with forward-facing, curved beaks. The outside of the thick shell had strong radial ribs that became broader and flatter toward the ventral margin. It had two teeth and sockets in each valve. Behind the teeth a long, curved depression housed the ligament. The interior margins of the valves had small crenellations. Crassatella was a bivalve with very strong concentric ribs parallel to the shell growth. The fossil shows a strong shoulder on each valve running from the beak to the ventral margin. Internally, it has deep, equally sizes adductor muscle impressions, with a distinct pallial line running between them. The adductor muscles were responsible for closing the shell, and the pallial line marks where the animal's mantle would have been attached. The hinge has two teeth below the beak in each of its valves. Chama is a bivalve with a strongly asymmetrical shell. The animal is attached to the seabed by its larger, more convex left valve throughout its life. The right valve is smaller and much flatter than the left, although still convex. Both valves had well-developed beaks. The valves grew spirally, along a horizontal plane. The surface of each valve shows concentric frills and radially arranged, flattened spines. These two features combine to give the shell a scaly appearance. Internally, there are two muscle scars, where the adductor muscles, which open the shell, attach in life. Glycimeris is fairly thick-shelled bivalve with an almost circular outline. Its beaks are situated more or less centrally on its midline. Beneath the beaks, and extending both to the front and rear of them, there is a large triangular area that is marked with tiny grooves, where the ligament was housed. Beneath the ligamental area is the hinge plate, which has numerous teeth and sockets that are smallest beneath the beaks, but become markedly larger and more curved as they follow the hinge margin around the outer curve. Pteridina was a very specialized type of bivalve mollusk. Its small, bivalve shell extended back into an irregularly shaped, long tube with a narrow opening. It bored into wood or other soft material in marine or brackish water by moving its valves from side to side. This activity caused excessive wear in the beaks of the valves, so extra plates were secreted to counter this problem. When young, the animal possessed a foot, but as it burrowed and became permanently lodged in a piece of wood, the foot wasted away. It is a relative of the modern shipworm Torito, a type of clam that burrows into wood, like them, Pteridina was a filter feeder, drawing water into its body and removing minute particles of food using specialized gills. It was long thought by fossil experts to be a type of tube worm because of the long, tube-shaped end to its shell. Lovenia was a flattened, heart-shaped, burrowing echinoid that lived buried in the sand of the seabed, usually in inshore waters. Some species of the genus, called heart urchins, still exist today, its fossils consist of the heart, test, or endoskeleton of the animal. Like all echinoderms, its body was split into five different sections, which appears as a star shape on the upper side of the fossilized test. This star shape comprised the five ambulacral areas, which had large pores around their margins, each of which would have been the site of a tube foot. One of the ambulacral areas formed a deep furrow that continued down to the oral surface, where the mouth was situated. There were several fascioles, smooth areas of the test surface that carried tracts containing small, hair-like extensions. The domed carapace of the fossil of the Paleocarpilius is oval in outline and smooth with spiny margins at the front and sides. The orbits which house the stocked icer well developed the pincers on the anterior limbs are clearly visible the right one is markedly larger and more robust than the one on the left. The movable finger on the right claw had a serrated inner edge which contrasted with the comparatively slender left pincer although crabs began to diversify greatly during the Cretaceous their numbers increased spectacularly during the Cenozoic era. This highly successful group is more numerous today than it has been at any time during its history. The earliest lobster-like crustaceans appeared during the Permian but they are not abundant in the fossil record until the Paleogene. This lobster had an elongated shell with a rounded margin at the front. 
The sides of the front and central parts of the carapace had a coarse rough texture. Its body was composed of five segments with smooth articulatory surfaces between them that were exposed when the abdomen was curled down. The abdomen formed a tail fan which the animal used for propulsion through the water. Following the demise of the dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous mammals and birds began to radiate into diverse forms on land underwater and in the sky. Early in the Paleogene fish and reptiles had taken on more recognizable forms and did not change very much. At the start of the Paleocene epoch 65 million year ago mammals were small and insectivorous with little limb or teeth specialization. They soon began to change in order to exploit the ecological niches left vacant by the dinosaurs, growing in size evolving new modes of locomotion and diversifying their diets to include plants and other vertebrates the mammalian radiation continued during the Oligocene. Bats are sparsely represented in the fossil record because their light bones and delicate wing membranes do not fossilize well. For this reason the precise time in evolutionary history that bats took to the air is not known. Their arm and greatly elongated finger bones support a stretchy skin membrane that powered by muscles. Time equals 0.2 s, greater than enables flapping flight. Bats probably evolved from a nocturnal insectivore that glided from tree to tree. The first eating bats did not appear until the Oligocene fossil record. At the beginning of the Paleogene, mammals had unspecialized teeth that could cope easily with their diet of insects. During the Paleocene epoch however, two major groups of mammals, the carnivores and the creodonts, evolved teeth suited to a diet of meat, carnassial teeth. The defining feature of modern day in a scissor-like action, while the large, pointed canines deliver the killing bite. Carnivore ancestors, the meacids, were small, weasel-sized mammals. Dogs appeared during the Middle Eocene and true cats in the early Oligocene, in parallel with a cat-like group called Nimravids, A distant relative of herrings and sardines, Diplomistus was a widespread freshwater fish. Many of the best specimens have been found in the Green River deposits of Wyoming. It had a single dorsal fin, pairs of small pectoral and pelvic fins, and an anal fin that stretched back to the narrow base of the tail. The tail itself was deeply forked, with the upper and lower parts of the fin being of equal size. A number of smaller fish have been preserved in the stomachs of Diplomistus fossils. Nitia is thought to have been a freshwater relative of the modern herring. Every year, huge numbers of Nitia fossils are unearthed at quarries in the Green River region, and they are a common sight in rock shops around the world. Most specimens are small, but very well preserved. The sheer number of specimens suggests that it lived in large schools in the Green River. Its body size and abundance tells us that the fish was probably a secondary feeder, filtering out ostracords, diatoms and other microscopic plankton in the lake water. Many skeletons have been found in the stomachs of larger fish. A member of the perch family, Meoplosis was a freshwater lake fish, its fossils are found singly, never in groups, and the fish is thought to have been a solitary hunter. It was also capable of attacking fish up to half its own size, using its many sharp teeth. A large tail, with symmetrical forks extended from a narrow base, suggests that it was a powerful swimmer. It had two dorsal fins, the first one lay just behind the pectoral fins, and the rear dorsal fin was positioned above the anal fin. Two species of mean have been found in significant numbers in northern Italy, at Monte Bolca. This site has yielded a number of fish fossils with a remarkably high degree of preservation. It is even possible to tell what color many of the specimens would have been in life. There is one surviving representative of the mean genus, the moonfish, mean maculate from the Indo-Pacific Ocean. This living species is typical of the genus, with its large eyes and protruding, upturned mouth. It is a marine fish with a very deep body, due mainly to downward expansion of its lower half. At the same time, the body is also highly compressed from side to side, its shape suggests that its body was rather stiff and capable of only limited movements. 
it is likely that most of the propulsive force was generated by rapid movement of its tail. Anguilla is a living genus better known by its common name, eel. Eels are early recognized by their distinctive, elongated bodies. The earliest anguilla fossils are from Monte Bolca. Unlike today's forms, these early specimens were marine in origin. Only later did the genus begin to exploit the brackish and freshwater habitats that it occupies today. Heliobatus may have been an ancient relative of the stingray, its fossils are common in the Green River of Wyoming. When the long tail spine is included, it was about one meter long, a similar size to many living stingrays. However, it was not as large as today's Chinese's stingray. Most modern stingrays live in seawater, but a few species inhabit river and lake habitats, the green. River deposits that contained Heliobatus specimens formed on the bottom of freshwater lakes. Hupigurus was a sea turtle that lived in subtropical seas between the early and middle Eocene. Fossils found in the USA and Europe all show the same species Pupigurus comperi, Unal 2005. This was thought to be the discovery of Pupigurus nesovi, a new species from Uzbekistan, was announced. It is an extinct genus in the Chiloniidae family. All living sea turtles belong to this family, except the leatherback. The Chiloniids appeared in the Cretaceous, but Pupigurus most resembled modern forms. For example, the shell was completely ossified into solid bone. In addition, the pigal, the rearmost plate in the upper shell, or carapace, also lacked the notch seen in earlier Chiloniids. Following the sudden demise of the dinosaurs, the snake Titanoboa was the largest land hunter of the Paleocene. It was also the largest snake ever known, being 30% larger than today's longest species, its back would have been one meter off the ground. Its enormous vertebrae were found in coal deposits in Colombia, along with the remains of the crocodiles and turtles preyed upon by the giant snake. Promapus is known from a single species whose specimens have been found in the London clay deposits of southeast England. It was an apodiform, a member of the order Apodiformes, whose living members include swifts and hummingbirds. It is uncertain whether Promapus is an early member of the swift family, Apodidae, or belonged to a now extinct sister family called Agilornithidae. Diatrema was a huge, flightless bird. It is known from complete skeletons found in early and middle Eocene rocks in the western United States that formed from a densely forested landscape. A very similar bird, Gasterny, lived in the forests of Europe at around the same time. Large diatrema specimens are more than 2 meters tall and have a huge skull bearing a robust beak with a hooked tip. It also had stout legs with massive clawed feet, but the wings were tiny and biostigial because the bird was too heavy to fly. It was once thought to be an active hunter, using its beak for crushing bones, but it is known assume that it ate fruit and seeds. It has been calculated that the beak was strong enough to cack open a coconut, but it probably supplemented its diet by scavenging dead bodies. As the global climate warmed, the forests turned to open plains. Despite its immensely powerful bite, diatrema was no match for the speed agility of the mammalian carnivores that evolved to hunt on the plains. Presbiornis has been found in large numbers in the Green River Shale of Wyoming and in Eocene deposits representing shallow freshwater lakes. Eggs and nests have also been found in the same rocks, and it probably lived in large flocks along the lake shores. It would have waded in the shallows and used its beak to filter out food from the water, as many ducks do today. It was one of the most successful species of its time, living for 20 million years. Leptictus was an early relative of the insectivores, modern mammals that include hedgehogs, moles and shrews. 
it would have stalked insects, amphibians and lizards. It had a long snout filled with small teeth. These included simple, V-shaped molars like those of some modern insectivores. Along the top of the skull was a pair of long ridges, where strong jaw muscles would have been attached. Plesiodopus looked like a ground squirrel in size and overall body plan, but was a relative of the primates. Even so, it had many rodent-like features, a pair of protruding incisors, a toothless gap between the front and back teeth, and eyes on the side of its head for spotting predators. It was so abundant that its species are used as index fossils for dating paleo nay deposits. Uintotherium was a giant horned mammal from the Middle Eocene, most of its fossils have been found in Utah and Wyoming, but it was widespread across North America and Asia, although probably in small numbers. It had huge upper canine tusks that protruded downward and were protected by a bony flange on the lower jaw. The snout had a series of blunt, horn-like growths, like modern rhinoceroses, both sexes had horns. As is true of horned mammals today, they probably used their horns for display and species recognition, Large upper canines are also used in display of some small deer today. Uintotherium has no living descendants, and where it fits in the family tree of hooded animals is a controversial subject. Andrew Sarkis was a giant predator that lived between about 40 and 37 million years ago. Most of what we know about this mammal comes from a single skull found in Mongolia. The skull is huge, more than one meter long and it is estimated that the animal's total body length was about 3, 7 meters long, with a weight of about 250 kilograms, that makes Andrew Sarkis the largest predatory land mammal that has ever lived. Its pointed teeth are often worn and blunt. This suggests that it not only hunted large prey but was also a scavenger. Its enormous jaws would have crushed the bones of animal carcasses. Hyenodon was a dog-like predatory mammal that lived across the northern hemisphere in the Oligocene and persisted into the early Miocene in Africa, finally dying out there 15 million years ago. There were many species of hyenodon, ranging in size from a weasel to a lion. It was probably the fastest predator of its time, but its legs were much shorter than those of a modern-day wolf. Although it looked like a modern hyena, with powerful jaws and sharp teeth for tearing flesh and breaking bones, it is not related to hyenas. It was the last surviving member of an extinct group of predators called creodonts. Hesperocyon is an extinct genus of dog that lived between the late Eocene and late Oligocene in North America. It is the earliest known member of the dog family, Canidae, and all modern species of dog, fox and wolf are believed to have evolved from this small mammal over the past 30 million years. However, Hesperocyon looked very different from modern dogs. It had a long, flexible tail, like that of a coati, but relatively weak, short limbs and a delicate skull capable of eating only small prey, such as birds and rodents. Its teeth suggest that it was an omnivore, and probably foraged on the ground and in bushes for fruits and other plant items to supplement its diet of meat. Icaronicteris is one of the earliest types of bats. It is known from a complete skeleton and a few other specimens from the Middle Eocene shales of Wyoming's Green River Formation. Like other insect-eating bats, it was small and a skillful flyer. It may have used an echolocation system to catch prey but it was much more primitive than any living bat. It had a long tail that was not connected to the hind legs, and its first finger bore a claw and was not fused to the wing membrane as in modern bats, an even more primitive bat, Onychonicteris, that was recently found in the same deposits lacks the inner ear features of modern bats indicative of echolocation. 1. The earliest known anteaters, Eurotamandua is known from a single complete skeleton fossil, it was originally thought to be related to Tamandua's tree-climbing anteaters from Central and South America. However, recent research has shown that Eurotamandua lacks the specialized vertebrae of anteaters, and their relatives, the sloths and armadillos. It may be related to modern pangolins, which are found in Africa and Asia. 
It was toothless and had a long tongue for licking up ants and termites. Large claws on its forefeet were used for ripping open insect nests, like modern tamanduas, it had a long, flexible tail for gripping branches. Aomis was a small, gliding rodent. Several nearly complete skeletons show that it had a long skin membrane between its front and back legs, similar to that of living flying squirrels. Although the Eurasian Aomis had evolved a gliding lifestyle, dozens of other members of the Aomaeidae family appear to have been ground or tree squirrels. The Aomaeids became extinct two million years ago. They are thought to have been relatives of modern pockets gophers. Paleologus is one of the earliest known fossil rabbits, the few C. Implete skeletons discovered show us that, in most respects, it resembled modern rabbits. However, it had shorter hind legs, and its skull and teeth were also much more primitive than those of most later rabbits. At least eight Paleologus species are recognized. Some of them had specializations in the ear region indicative of acute hearing. It was descended from Procaprologus, which in turn evolved from an earlier animal originating in Asia. Protoroopus is one of the earliest known horses, its fossils were unearthed in western USA. It was about the size of a beagle or terrier, with short limbs bearing four toes on the front feet and three toes on the hind feet. The name Hyracotherium was once applied to early American horses, but recent research shows that this name applies to a horse-like European mammal, not a horse. An extinct horse about the size of a Great Dane dog, Mesohippus was found in the Big Badlands fossil beds of South Dakota. Like modern horses, it had a long snout with a gap between its front teeth and cheek teeth. Its teeth also show that Mesohippus was a specialized leaf eater. During the early Oligocene, there were more than a dozen Mesohippus species. By the end of that epoch it lived alongside its later relative Meohippus in several places. Subharacodon was a hornless rhinoceros from the late Eocene and Oligocene. It has been found in rocks across North America. It was not heavily armored like modern rhinoceroses, and avoided danger by running away on its relatively long, slender legs. The cheek teeth had low crowns suited for eating the leaves of trees and bushes, and they had the characteristic pie-shaped pattern of crests that is typical of living rhinos. At one time, many different species were named, although they have been reduced to just three valid species today. In the late Oligocene, Subharacodon evolved into Dyserotherium. This was a larger animal and it had paired bony ridges on its nose, which are thought to have supported short horns. This animal was the last and largest member of the Brontotheres, meaning, Thunder Beast. Megaserops was the size of a small elephant and lived on the Great Plains of North America. It had a forked horn on its nose that was relativel. Why delicate and so was probably not used for head-to-head -head fighting. Mesoriodon was an oriodon, an extinct sheep-sized, event-toed hoofed mammal. Like other oriodons, it had sharp canine teeth, presumably used for display and defense. Oriodons were not very fast runners, and probably lived in herds for protection. Several complete mesoriodon skeletons have been found, one of which had preserved vocal cords that show that it could make loud sounds like modern howler monkeys. These hooting calls may have warned the herd or attacks or frightened off predators. This squirrel-sized primate, nicknamed Ida, is remarkable for being the most complete primate fossil ever found. Even its final meal of leaves and fruit is preserved in its stomach. Darwinus's skeleton shows it to have been an agile but generalized climber and some scientists think that this animal, while still technically a prosimian, is close to the origins of anthropoid primates, and thus a distant ancestor to humans. Eosimias is an extinct primate genus that is one of the oldest known basal anthropoids, the group that contains monkeys and apes. 
It is known from the Middle Eocene beds in China. It was a tiny primate. Some were only about the size of a human thumb. Its grasping hands and long tail gave it the appearance of a tiny marmoset, but it is unrelated. Like marmosets, it probably caught insects to supplement its fruit diet. The presence of this animal, and other species of primitive anthropoids, in the Eocene of Asia suggests that Asia was the birthplace of this group, rather than Africa as previously assumed. Leptomerix was a hornless ruminant from the late Eocene and Oligocene. Its fossils have been found in many parts of North America, and it is one of the most abundant fossils in the Big Badlands fossils beds of South Dakota. It was about the size of a mouse deer or chevrotain. It had relatively slender limbs bearing two hoofed toes on each foot. It was an artiodactyl, or an even toed hoofed mama. Although it is only distantly related to living chevrotains, Leptomerix had many similar features, including a delicate stature, the absence of any antlers or horns and in the case of the males, enlarged upper canines that protruded as small tusks. Recent research has revealed that it was among the most primitive of ruminants, and therefore, a distant relative of all ruminants, including deer, cattle and camels. An ancestor of modern whales, Ambulocetus retained strong legs and could walk as well as swim. It may have hunted like crocodiles, lurking in the shallows and then lunging forwards onto land to catch prey that wandered near the water. Ambulocetus was a relative of modern whales because of the shape of its skull and teeth. The similarity of its jaw and middle ear to that of modern whales suggests that, like them, it was specialized for underwater hearing and might have lacked the external ear that picks up sounds on land. It is one of many transitional fossils that show how whales evolved from land mammals. Meritherium was one of the earliest fossil relatives of the proboscidae, the family that includes the elephants and mammoths, its short proboscis made it look similar to a taper. However, it also had short tusks like other members of the proboscidae, and many other features of the skull and skeleton that show it is a proboscidean, not a relative of tapers. The semi-aquatic nature of the earliest proboscideans were semi-aquatic, and that their lineage became fully terrestrial only later. <laughs> 